We will have a conversation between Mette Skjold and Sir Parta Dasgupta. And um, as it has been throughout this Congress, it is an architecture Congress and World Congress for Architects, so the architect will speak first. So let me invite to the stage Mette Skjold. Mette Skjold is the CEO of SLA. Welcome, Mette. CEO of SLA, founded in 1994, a world-renowned nature-based design studio with a global presence. And I understand that you have offices here in Copenhagen, in Aarhus, in Oslo, in, in Norway. Uh, and I understand also that what you're doing, it's about landscaping and combining the recreational and aesthetic nature, uh, nature of things uh, and, and value of nature, not just about technologies and economics, Yes, that's all very important, but there are other values that must be factored in as well. And that we will go to, we will hear more of in just a moment, but our other guest this morning, that is Sir Patsatas Gupta, Emeritus Professor of Economics at the University of Cambridge, and he's the driving force behind the economics of biodiversity, the Das Gupta Review. The review was done on behalf of the, or for the UK government, and it was handed over, the results, the review, to the UK government back in February 2021. Uh, and the whole thing there is, how can we factor in nature in our economic modeling and all that in a very, very different manner. It made a huge splash. Well, it also made a huge impact on governments, well, remains to be seen, I think, but we will hear more from uh, Sir Dasgupta in just a moment. However, unfortunately, Sir Dasgupta in the last minute had to stay back home, but we are fortunate enough to have him with us virtually. So uh, good morning to Sir Dasgupta. I know that where you are, you are one hour behind our time here, so it's early in the morning. And I guess that you can now enjoy a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or whatever while we listen to uh, Meta's presentation. Please, you have the floor, Meta. Thank you. And good morning to all of you. Nice to see you here. Well, looking at this chart, understanding that we humans are a very tiny part of the biomass on this planet, you could ask the question, should plants rule the world? Or do they already? Our effect on our land is quite substantially. We leave very little nature untouched. 5% of our land cover is covered by cities. And urbanization is happening rapidly. So I invite you to picture a mega city. Close your eyes for a couple of seconds. How many of you see in your mind skyscrapers and hardscape? Can you raise your hand? Thank you. How many of you see lush nature, thriving, summer butterflies, birds? Can you raise your hand? All right. To a large extent, nature as such is something we regard that is outside the city. And this small practice, this small exercise actually showed that that's where we are, even though I know I'm between friends and peers uh, in this room. If you include the ecosystem services by nature-based design into our cities, the value proposition is substantial. We tend to, to divide into two different categories of values, the utility values, CO2 sequestering, we all learn that plants, they take CO2 and make clean air out of it and store it in the soil. It can leave our cities much more resilient towards future threats 
that's a cause of climate change, but also the amenity values that belongs to us as humans, how we thrive, how we connect, how we belong and learn about nature that, is, that we are all embedded in. Research has, uh, has on this field where people in their work environment, in their living environment, are in everyday close connection with nature, has made many upsides. So, if you work in a close everyday connection with nature experience, you increase productivity by 6%. You even minimize sick days for the employees. And you have a a quite substantial uh, improvement of job certification. Creativity increases. Aarhus University did a study on a million children in Europe based on satellite data mapping their whereabouts in their everyday life. And those children that had everyday connection with nature experience minimizes the risk of having the 17 largest mental disorders by 55%. And I know that it's cheaper to prevent, to plant, to include nature into our cities than it is to recover these children. So all these effects we take into everything we do. This is an image of uh, Tobias, our team leader, Sti, our client, and Tina, our biologist, out in nature north of Copenhagen, trying to find a specific plant species called a water pineapple. It's also named as a water soldier a water plant, and we were lucky this day. We didn't know, but we were lucky. We actually found that water pineapple. And Tina here stands with it in her hands. That specific plant is a prerequisite for these type of wonders. A special green mosaic dragonfly. So these type of design parameters on ecosystem services, on the interrelated, uh, on the, in the, inter the connection between flora and fauna, we take into design in order for housing areas to actually include these wonders in their everyday life. For the same client, we did a biodiversity strategy. This client is, is amongst the top 50 largest pension funds in Europe. We made a biodiversity strategy. They had a mission, they have a mission of their real estate portfolio to become nature positive. We made a set of tools for them to act upon, to evaluate, putting it into the first biodiversity annual report in the Danish real estate market. So, this is a nurse, she just parked her car and is on her way into a hospital to do her work. We planted more than 2,500 trees, 20,000 smaller trees. We, we hope, we already know, that we can harvest some of the benefits that nature in a close uh, relation in, in a hospital, both for the patients, for the next in kind, and for the employees. We let one of the trees, or some of the trees, go horizontal uh, in order to decay and kickstart the biodiversity evolvement on this site. Another famous power plant, we did the nature trail, where you walk uphill, almost getting nature in your face. 
The plant design here was uh, made as a concept for spreading. Denmark is a very flat land, so this is a quite substantial hill. So the wind condition is, it is very windy. And it's based in an industrial harbor. The nature trail is open 24 seven for the publics to go and explore and get a nice view over Copenhagen. Our biologists uh, assessed this site. So not the surroundings where the nature should spread, but actually on site, on construction, on a rooftop. And just after a year, the amount, the biodiversity, the biodiversity doubled. So taking this type of nature-based design into a more general part of a city, a normal housing street and a roundabout, for centuries, or maybe for decades, centuries, we have been creating infrastructure with a section that is convex in order to get the water away from the streets. This project, we did the opposite and included nature so we could actually celebrate when it rains, celebrate the atmosphere that it brings to our everyday lives in cities. This is the roundabout as it was, and this is as it is, including 600 trees, many shrubs, grass types, and perennials into this site. And in a year, it almost turned into an urban jungle for neighbors to thrive in. And the capacity for traffic at this roundabout and the normal housing street is completely the same. The turning radius for the buses, there's the same amount of parking lots, but still you can include nature and make nature thrive as it is. I'm just going to drink a little water. So, do you see a bird? This bird is a Eurasian blue tit. This bird has home in trunks of trees where the holes are. It, it eats spiders and insects. And this bird is an indicator on that in this housing street and roundabout, the ecosystems are thriving. So I have a suggestion. The next UIA, could it be leave no species behind? So last, all cities have these type of uh, neighborhoods, social housing. It's kind of the heydays of modernism landing on planet Earth, very Cartesian, putting in the people. We did a nature, a nature park here, 1, 000, one, uh, 11 hectares for the residents to thrive, to live, to enjoy with everyday contact with nature. In this area, 70 nationalities are living. We included playgrounds, many different types of species for them to enjoy, have informal meetings, edible species, and it's all climate adapted. Safety is key. We included many, many native species, but also exotic species where the microclimate allows it. And a lot of edible species as well. And just look at it, this picture, 
the wonders of nature, we should include this. We physically opened up the neighborhood to the surrounding areas, inviting people, visitors in to enjoy the park. We are at SLA currently lead landscape designers on three major sites in London. And in 2021, the city administration, the Lord Mayor of London's office, made a regulation in, uh, into force, demanding that developing sites, you, in order to get the building permit and the permit for actually doing that, you should, you should prove that you enhance biodiversity by 10%. And for sure, this is a start, uh, and it's good, it's doing good, but we can do so much more. So I thank you very much. We have done an exhibition out here with our close collaborators, uh, Melmos, uh, landscape gardeners. All these trees are for sale. They are Nordic species. You can listen to a bird. You can even see that the soil is also alive. So I inv invite you to go and explore. It's the last day. At 3.30, all the trees will be moved out of this building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Medeskjold. And that was a teaser, but please don't go out and watch it just right now. There will be a break <laughs> later. Uh, now we are going to hear from uh, the other keynote speaker this morning. And Sir Dasgupta, I know that you wondered how come you had been invited for an architect's conference, Congress, to address that one. But I can tell you that I'm sure that what you're going to tell us now about the economics and how it works and how it should be working, that fits extremely well into what we have been discussing over the recent three days. So uh, we are very much looking forward to your presentation. And you have the floor now, and I can tell you there are literally hundreds of people sitting in this room listening to what you will now tell us. Please. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, good morning, and please accept my apologies uh, for not being with you, but it was a last-minute ill health that happens when you grow old, unexpected. But I'm all right now, and I'm delighted to be with you. Brilliant first talk we've just heard from Mete explains to me as to why I was invited. I want therefore to point to some of the errors of reasoning uh, that my own discipline, which is profoundly important, and we've inherited a grammar from our forefathers, Adam Smith downward, uh, which is excellent. We have the analytical tools, but I think. I want to show you in the next 10 minutes or so uh, how we've gone awry and how it can be fixed, it being our discipline and the way we uh, connect with the rest of our lives. Now, it is not often that earth scientists and economists arrive at a similar truth. Earth scientists have recently argued on the basis of evidence that the human dominated uh, earth system is only about 70 years old. And for clarity, they have decided to think of 1950, the immediate post-war period, as the start of what they now called the Anthropocene. Economic data, global economic data, are consistent with that viewpoint. GDP, the most commonly used index of human well-being, quote unquote, grew by a factor of 15 in the, over the 70 year period from 1950 to 2020. Population grew, human population grew from 2.5 billion to the current 8 billion. Per capita income, the average standard of living in, in the globe increased by Five, fivefold. Life expectancy increased from 46 to 72 years. And deep poverty, extreme poverty, 
was reduced from about 60% of the global population to something like 10% today. I'm talking about global figures only now, and I will do so for the rest of this talk. Now, these are unprecedented events, and of course, to be celebrated. The problem is that that's all we look at. Notice that none of these indicators, although extremely important, makes any mention of the state of nature, of what has happened to nature during this process. GDP, if you will recall, is gross domestic product. It does not include the depreciation of capital assets that goes possibly goes with the growth process. But of course, when we include, when we talk about capital assets, we tend to think of buildings and roads and cities, as Mete very eloquently showed. And human capital, health and education, and certainly the data I just pointed to are those. Um, it also includes natural capital, ecosystems, wetlands, grasslands, mangroves, coral reefs, and of course, forests, peat, and so forth. All that is missing in the economic statistics that we receive. So we do not know the state of the environment. The growth process that we have followed is one in which we have accumulated, produced capital, the ones I just now mentioned, and human capital. And I will show in a minute that it was done at the expense of natural capital. In other words, we have degraded it. Now I've talked about natural capital or the biosphere. Uh, I'm going to use nature and the biosphere uh, equivalently. It's a self-regenerative asset. The essence of nature, to my mind today, is it's incredible, the infinite variety of rhythms from the very fast to the very, very slow, somehow interlocking uh, into the mesh that makes for nature's processes. And I want to come back to this notion of rhythms right at the end. That gives rise to two types of uh, services, if you like, goods and services. Recently, um, ecologists have distinguished provisioning goods, nature's provisioning goods, from regulating and maintenance services she offers. By provisioning goods, we mean food, water, timber, fibers, pharmaceutical products, and non-living material. In fact, notice these are the goods and goods which, when with human ingenuity, we transform into final products, gives rise to what we call GDP. So those are provisional goods. There are direct demands from nature. But the background are regulating and maintenance services. Now, these are services. They essentially reflect processes, climate regulation, decomposition of waste, nitrogen fixation, air and water purification, soil regeneration, and pollination. And these are just a few. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other services that are being provided. That these are the rhythms that I mentioned earlier of Mother Nature. Two things are non-transparent about regulating services and maintenance services. The first is they're often invisible and they're also silent. Not always, but a great deal of them. Think of all the things that are happening beneath our, our feet in the soils or in the deep seas or deep in the forests. We do not see them, see what's happening. We don't hear them. And of course that makes it extremely, the entire operation extremely vulnerable to human encroachment. And a third feature of nature, which is all important, is that she's mobile. She's always on the move. I mentioned the rhythms, but the fact is of course, material, the provisioning goods are transported across time and space these three features make Mother Nature an extremely fragile commodity, quote unquote. Fragile in the sense that it's not possible to keep a record of what we are doing to her. Of course, it's possible in principle, but certainly markets don't do that. And that's been the trouble. 
Now, there are two features, there are, there are three, fe three features I want to highlight. The nature's regulating and maintenance services are the fundamental. They're processes, but they give rise to the provisioning goods, the food and the water and the timber. We have increasingly drawn on nature's regulating and maintenance services to provide ourselves with provisioning goods by transforming the landscape. There is thus an inevitable tension between provisioning goods on the one hand and regulating and maintenance services on the other. But as I said, regulating and maintenance services are fundamental. Without them, there would be no provisioning goods. Our ever increasing demand for provisioning goods, that's the rise in GDP, has led to a decline in nature's ability to supply regulating and maintenance services. Today, the ratio of the demand we make on Mother Nature's provisioning goods and Mother Nature's ability to supply them with the, on a sustainable basis is about 1.7, and that's an underestimate, which is why we often say these days that we need 1.7 Earths to satisfy our demands. The second point is that unlike provisioning goods that often allow for substitutes among themselves, solar panels substituting for oil and natural gas, for example, regulating and maintenance services are complements to one another, e.g. carbon regulation and biodiversity. If one goes, if, if there's effective pressure on one of the processes, the others get pressed too. Now, Complementarities doesn't mean that nature is a box of cards, uh, in the house of the house of cards, which that's which the ultimate, you remove one card and the whole house right, falls apart. Nature is not like that, she's resilient. But we humans now are so powerful, so ingenuous, so clever, that if we put our mind to it, we can make her, turn, turn her into a house of cards as we are doing now. Now, this distinction between the complementarities in regulating and maintenance services and the substitutable po possibilities amongst provisioning goods is a key. Concentrating on provisioning goods, as economics has done in modern times, has meant that we are constantly seeking substitutes and think we can get away with it. If something runs out, there's scarcity, well, we'll find ingenuity, we'll find something else which will, could be used instead. The problem is that comfort, that luxury is not available with regulating and maintenance services, and hence the complementarities are extremely important. So economic development in practice has come to mean the accumulation of produced capital, roads, buildings, ports, and machines, and human capital, health, and education at the expense of natural capital, ecosystems, non-living material. Now you'll notice that all the data that you read the evidence you read about economic progress in newspapers, magazines, political speeches, and so forth, are essentially about provisioning goods. They do not talk about the regulating and maintenance services, which are the backbone of our entire existence. And to show you, may I have the next slide, please? How the development process in the recent past has occurred. A recent work from the United Nations Environment Program has tracked, these are all very, very uh, approximate results, by the way, but it's better to be approximate when you are looking at the right thing than to be very non-approximate, very, very precise when you're looking at the wrong thing. So all the attempts at refining measurement of GDP, its distribution, in some sense is targeting the wrong index. We ought to be looking at wealth, what we own, the stocks of capital assets, including natural capital. The figure here, the and I'm showing, is a time series from 19 uh, from from 1992 to 2014. This period, 28 years, um, uh, 22 years, produced capital per capita. Per cap this is a global assessment, doubled. Human capital per capita increased by about 20%, nearly 20%. But na the natural capital per capita, i.e. the stocks of our ecosystems and other things that I mentioned just now, um, per capita declined by 40%.
But this decline, the third of these, the downward sloping curve that you just see, it's not available in national statistics. So this is in, in a broad way, a picture of what has gone wrong. We've underpriced nature. They're usually not priced. Think of the oceans, for example. We have deep sea mining, fishing, transportation, so trillions of dollars of goods, luxury travel, and fishing. And yet, nobody pays anything for it. It's an open access resource. It suffers from the tragedy of the commons. So that's only one example. And on top of that, of course, we subsidize ourselves for using nature to the tune of something like five to six trillion dollars a year, which means that nature has a negative price. So you could see the pressure that we impose on it. So all this is really saying that we are, we have, our entire grammar is built on a set of missing words. And that's, that's been the problem. Matthias very, very eloquently pointed out to the aesthetic, even spiritual aspects of nature. And it should be no surprise that they are. We are, after all, embedded in nature, we humans. We are only 200,000 years old. We are nothing. Um, our emotions were developed in the Paleolithic times. We are small group animals. We are directed uh, in nature. We are ourselves ecosystems. We harbor millions and millions of organisms inside us, and they're part of us. So the idea that nature has aesthetic value, even spiritual value, and not just utilitarian value, which is what I've been discussing so far, is, 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 is an ancient one. The ancients recognize all three features of nature. But I like to think that in some sense, the, the culture that I was raised in, essentially a Vedantic, Vedic culture, translated, of course, over the centuries into modern conceptions of Hinduism, um, is one in which, which effectively concentrated on the rhythms of nature, the regulating and maintenance processes, but when seen as rhythms. The Vedic hymns that I was raised on in my school, in the morning assembly, were celebrations of or welcoming or homage to dawn or dusk or creation. Now, these are processes. Dawn doesn't mean the sun. It's a process where a change is taking place and a sense of renewal. So it seems to me that this is something that we may be losing this sense that we are embedded in nature and that everything that we value is connected to it, is related to it, is something that we may be missing. And a final point, in some sense, the dominance of the human kind on nature began some time ago. It's not just 1950. I'm using 1950 to show that it's really taken off in a big way, in a massive way. But if you think of the word paradise, its origins lie in Persian, um, referring to an enclosed green space. To our forefathers are the sages, the bards of 2,000, 3,000 years ago, the Vedic bards. That would be unthinkable. Why enclosed? They would be thinking of an unlimited space because they want to, we want to be able to ask if there is no wall as to what lies beyond the horizon. And that inquisitiveness, it seems to me, is at the heart of our, um, the human condition. And when we suppress it, I think, we lose something of great value. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Padre Gupta.
Uh, very uh, strong messages here, and uh, Meta will come back to you in a moment, but maybe first to Sodas Gupta, because you, you ended up saying that we may be losing this sense that we are embedded with nature and we are depending on it. What is the tool then to refine that necessary understanding, that link that you say that we have? lost? I think there are two. One is direct experience of the kind that Mette so eloquently brought out in her talk. The experience in an increasingly urban world uh, to, to create the space. That's an imperfect substitute, but it's a substitute, all right. It's a way of doing that. We need the experience and continual experience, not, not just in the weekend when we drive out. So Bethesda's examples are absolutely superb, that you should be always within the neighborhood. Uh, there's been a good deal of work to show why that's so important. So that's one. But the other, the one which I emphasized a great deal in my uh, review, was I was convinced that what we really need is education on nature. We need from the primary school onwards, and not just initial years, but right through. In England, for example, the focus is on the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and that's absolutely right. But a fourth should be nature studies. And the reason is that we need to emphasize it over and over again to bring us back into connection with it, because the market system or the state system, our economic institutions, are not geared to offering that it doesn't come in naturally, so to speak, uh, for goods like bicycles, cars, food, and processed food, and so forth. You don't need to have any special treatment of the system offers them. Perhaps too much, but at least it's there. But this is, these are the missing items. And in my little talk, I tried to explain why they're missed. These, uh, these processes are missed and the nature's goods and services are missed and we get more and more, more detached from them because what we see are processed final goods, the GDP aspects of things, the final products that we buy and sell in the marketplace uh, or transact with our communities. Um, so education, it seems to me, is something that really is important. Mm -hmm. We really need increasingly to do that. Now, in in response, I suspect, there has been a movement in that direction within the UK, but the UK has now decided there will be a policy of the education ministry to in introduce an optional paper at the GCSE, that is to say when you're about 15 or so uh, on nature. But of course, that's not, that's not what we need. We need it. Optional paper, of course, makes it little, little likely to be seen as a soft option. Mm. Uh, what we really need is to make it a pro prominent thing right from the word go. And it would be lovely if we could have the education <laughs> system produce books uh, called something like The World Around Us, a series of books for each year, uh, starting <laughs> from the first year of school. And I know, Meta, that that is also one of your hobby horses, that somehow education is key to this. Yeah, definitely. We should... Uh, in, in our cities, in everything we do, we should connect also to the physical experience of nature because in that is the learning. And in our urban environments, in our environments in general, uh, cities, it's kind of that that understanding is, is, uh, is out. Our, uh, and we, I mean, nature is our connective tissue but it's not part of our everyday life. And, I, and, and just going back to what, what neuroscientists can actually measure, they can measure that it affects us directly in our nervous system when we are with nature and in nature. And, and, and in general, it's not to sort of mimic nature or to invite wolves and mooses into our cities, but it's, it's understanding the performance of nature in order to get those ecosystem services to thrive in our cities. And that value proposition is so manifold. Both, uh, as I mentioned, the utility values, cleaning air, uh, stormwater sequestering, minimizing urban heat islands, but also on the 
you know, being human, understanding that we are, as you said, Pata, that we are embedded in nature and we are depending on it. That's our supply for everything that we consume, construct, and create. But it's, it's, it's kind of as, as, in general, humans are taking that service for granted. Uh, so I, I, I completely agree on learning, but how do we do the learning uh, more uh, present in our everyday life? I would, I could, may I um, extend one thought uh, to, to the, one, the, the ones that you just now mentioned? Uh, you're absolutely right. I had it in mind that education means, uh, the kind of education I have in mind was not reading books only. Obviously, there will be the books without that. Mm. But I had it in mind that you would, children from the earliest stages would be encouraged to muck around in nature, mm. dig in the soil a bit to mm. see what's going on. Mm. But the reason is that in my job, the way I see it, it's you develop a love for these processes, this infinite tapestry that Mother Nature offers us. If you begin to understand her workings, not necessarily at a scientific level, but simply observing motion of, uh, you know, of observing, for example, different states of decay of leaves in the autumn and ask why are some leaves more <laughs> decayed than the others? That's, that's the kind of thing. And the reason I think that's important is that I think if it's only when you begin to understand the complexity of these processes that nature involves, Mm. that begin to develop an affection for her. Mm. And, and, and if, is, that's good, sir. If you ask people, I mean, yes. we just ask the audience here, does anyone, do, do you not like trees? I mean, I don't know anyone who doesn't like a tree, who doesn't love to be in it, around surroundings where they are, uh, who, who doesn't enjoy uh, listening to a bird. So for me, it's kind of, I mean, we should include it much more into what we do. I understand very much what the sculptor says and what you also allude to, Mehdi, is that it's not just about having a subject there or a subject there, it's about building in sort of a broader sense. Uh, but Patsada Skupta, have, I have been working with a sort of the economics uh, university studies and tried to make them change their curricula because it is somehow a puzzle that when medicines show and prove that actually it's good for productivity, creativity, job satisfaction, mental health, you mentioned, and you sort of can prove that there is also seen f through the normal economic lens an advantage in respecting nature and valuing nature more. Can you explain to us, Das Gupta, <laughs> How come that it's not a natural part of educating modern economists? That's a, I mean, that's really um, uh, almost impossible to answer. I, believe me, I've thought a lot about it, goes without saying, because I've been working on my field of uh, um, e ecological economics for about 40 years now. So, of course, it goes through my mind. Uh, I haven't even been able to influence my own department to change its curriculum to include these Largely because it's not a resistance to it because, you know, people don't care. The material isn't there, if you like. Now the question is, why isn't it? So and you I have to write that book. Is yeah. it, <laughs> yes, but I think one reason is that um, it's important to see how uh, path-dependent scientific endeavor is. Typically, a researcher works, writes a paper, which corrects or improves upon or finesses somebody else's paper the year before. So it's very path dependent. And if you turn, take a wrong turn right at the beginning, maybe at a time when we were not as important as a species, say 100 years ago, globally, we were not a big species. Our demand was less than what nature could support globally, I mean, okay? Add to that, that these curricul curricula were developed in the West and Western countries, that is to say the North, if you like, that's what we call it now, Europe, America, and so forth. They have essentially outsourced their demands 
for biodiversity. We don't have much biodiversity in England, but we are doing pretty well in GDP terms, or have been in the past, only because we import the primary products from the tropics, which has houses huge amounts of biodiversity, mm. and we import them. So we don't actually see the value, the worth of natural capital in our production process, because everything comes from as processed goods. That may have some explanatory power as to why people, at least in the, 100 years ago or so, felt that nature was unlimited because you run out of something, you go to another place to get that a substitute for it, which brings me back to my substitution notions. Okay. Now, I know this is not a, you know adequate answer, but I don't have an adequate answer. It will take quite a while before nature gets plugged into mainstream economic thinking and a shift in our attention to data which have nature embedded in the, in the data set. It's not happening yet. Um, now, there, it's not as though universities don't have courses on environmental economics, resource economics, even ecological economics, but they're not in economics departments. That's, that's the point you, I think you're trying to make. That is, they are in schools of the environment in the United States, for example. And so it's outside the mainstream, and it's the mainstream economics which dominates public policy, because the finance ministers of countries are yesterday's economic students. Hmm. So the biases run through over time across different professions. I'm sorry, I can't do anything bad. Thank you. Mede, I wonder, when you're doing your projects, you showed uh, some of them uh, to us, is this lack of factoring in, in the traditional economic sense, factoring in eco-services, is that an obstacle when you come there and present what you want to do? There's definitely need for new uh, systems for, uh, you know, uh, feasible, uh, including that into how we develop as architects, as urban planners. So there is a demand and there's a need for new tools and new regulations. The European Commission just did a taxonomy uh, of six different, where you, where you, where you are, it, it came into force 1st of uh, January. And that's the reason why we are doing this. A taxonomy for investors. Yeah, exactly. For finance, for World Economic Forum, where, where Pata is doing his everyday, his everyday speech. Um, so there is need, but there's also need in, in us to, uh, to sort of understand how to, to argument in order to get it into like the everyday equation of our societal development. So when you develop a land, it's not only about the amount of square meters and the, you know, profit line in the, in the economic models of that. We need to sort of have new models for, 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 for evaluating both, all the value propositions, I guess. And it's, I mean, we all know that real estate uh, is all about location. Um, so why don't we start there? to actually understand what's at hand. No, we just like, you know, as, as the heydays of modernism, that's to a large extent still how we build and construct, instead of understanding what is already there and understand what's in the growth medium, how can we make that thrive, uh, understanding these processes and, and getting them close to people. I think, Pata, when I visited you in Cambridge, we had a walk in the college gardens, and I asked you um, how, when you talk in world economic forums, what's their eureka about your research, about your empirical work? What is it that resonates with them? And you said something about that they got an insight on that we are not competing we are out of the same basis. Or maybe you can elaborate a little bit of that. I think that would be nice for the audience. Well, first of all, thank you for asking. And again, I'm not going to be a very satisfactory answer to your qu query, because I'm not sure I know what resonates. But here is one, which is, uh, since my review was uh, submitted in, 
in February 2021, the, the Treasury, the UK Treasury, very kindly kept part of my team for another year for the help with the with, for dissemination purposes. So since then, I would probably take participation in about 200 to 220 events, um, interviews, lectures, uh, panels like this one, and, and so forth. First of all, I haven't actually been to any economic, uh, World Economic Forum. I've so far avoided doing that. But <laughs> I've spoken to, of course, international decision, uh, yeah. inter heads of international Big banks, etc. Yeah. And so forth. Yes. What resonates is the following. My review, very, the talk I gave you just now, the reflections that I made, focused at the end on the aesthetic and the spiritual aspects of nature. In my review, of course, there is a chapter on that, goes without saying. But for the most part, I looked at the instrumental value of nature. That is to say, the productivity of nature in terms of providing us with the provisioning goods. Okay, because that's the ones which we want. And essentially, we are saying our demand for provisioning goods is eating into nature's ability to provide the maintenance and regulating services, which then it come back and put pressure on the, on the provisioning goods themselves. So this mutual feedback is the source of the dilemma. Now, putting it that way does resonate amongst economists and decision makers because they can see that as, a, as an economic process, quote unquote. Why? Because I was thinking of these ecosystems as natural capital assets. These are assets. So I to convert it, I tried to convert the economics of biodiversity into an asset management problem. Mm. Study asset management, mm. in which one class of crucial assets don't have prices. Mm -mm. And so then you can then see that the management has gone wrong because there is a set of extremely important assets which are not tangible in the marketplace. Mm. So they get there's pressure on them and they disappear. And if they feed back onto difficulties in maintaining the other assets, we are in trouble. I think it's that which has resonated because they see, because and, and, and I wasn't doing that for political purposes or tactical purposes. I, I'm an economist, so I do see it in that form. It's just that this particular class of assets has features which are very different from the assets that we are usually talk about, which is produced capital and even human mm. capital. So well, you, yeah. sorry, no, no, I, but you also said that for you as a as part of the scripta, biodiversity in this research actually precedes climate. And I think to a large extent, that is where we should start. Because biodiversity, wonders of nature, goes close to our heart. Uh, here in, in, in Copenhagen, it's something that we can understand uh, that affects us, even in our gardens. And uh, the, where's the bumblebees? Where are they? Where are they? how it's raining immensely. But um, a couple of years ago, 26,000 people were making a large ring around uh, a site, sort of uh, opposing for the site to be developed. And that's because of love to that specific site's nature. It's not, it's not rational, but that, that is love. Uh, and, I, I, and, and to some extent, biodiversity is more uh, relevant to everyday actions for us as humans. So I, I think going back to the learning and, and the relation and the everyday experience in nature uh, definitely is just a starting point. And even during COVID, people were lying about nature experiences. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and all our green parks, at least here in Copenhagen and in Europe, were, were definitely used uh, very much. So there is, there is a demand. Yeah. I would like to add to what Mette has said in a slightly different way. Um, and the two ways are complementary and that might help the audience. Climate regulation is only one of the services that, that I I, I, I hinted, I showed on this second, uh, the, the first slide. Uh, Mother Nature has many other services. Pollination is one. Uh, decomposition of waste is another. Carbon, um, uh, nitrogen fixation is a third, and so forth. Okay. 
So one reason I like Mate is is concerned that we are putting so much attention on climate, which is extremely important because with that, remember these are all complementary services. Mm. So if one disappears or mm. put pressure, then the others are affected. But the reason I'm somewhat skeptical of not focusing on biodiversity and the other services that come um, is that the way the economics of climate change has developed, and there is a huge literature now, it sees climate regulation as an isolated service mm. that Mother Nature offers. Not, the others are, include, are not included. And now the potential for substitutability in our provisioning goods looms as you know, clean energy as opposed to from dirty energy. Now the thought here is, and to put it in simple terms, something like 2% of GDP, global GDP, if invested in clean energy, leads, leading to zero net, net zero, will allow us to have indefinite growth forever after that. Mm. That's been the danger of the subject. And my review has really resisted that and showing that actually unlimited growth is not a viable proposition uh, for, because of all the other uh, services that Mother Nature offers. So it's not the unimportance of climate. Climate is extremely important and that's going to be playing havoc with our lives. It's no, no, that you're right. Solutions that we go for yeah. have been really in, wrong because the unintended consequences on the other processes if we simply think of substituting away mm. our problems from climate are really fundamentally worrying. <laughs> That's the difficulty. And so I think that that is probably the core of many of the challenges we are faced with, yeah. that uh, the complexity of things. We have over these days been discussing many aspects of the sustainable development goals. And, and of course, the, the job is to, to sort of take care of everything at the same time, but there are some trade-offs, there are some priorities, some different political and other choices to, to be made. So I just wondered, you reflected that in your report, some of the complexity here and the need for a more holistic approach. Could you enlighten us a bit? Now it's two and a half years since you gave that report to the world, one could say, but you handed it over to the British government. Did it make any impact? In, in sort of the real politics. I saw that the British Prime Minister retired voluntarily a few days ago saying that nothing is happening here, it's, it's hopeless. <laughs> so I just wondered, could you, is there some hope in when you do this solid work, then it actually leaves impact, not decades down the road, but a little bit faster? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could give you the proper answer to that also. I, I, on the whole, I resist even asking myself, do I have hope or not? Because I'm scared of asking the question, if you like, <laughs> in case I get an answer which is depressing, okay? Um, okay, so there have been some successes. For example, now the idea of having a monitoring natural capital is, is now a commonplace. The Office of National Statistics in the UK government is now going to be is producing natural capital accounts. It's important. It's extremely important to let citizens know the state of the world, if you like, not just what the GDP is or employment figures and so forth. And other countries are doing that as well. I think that's that's been a success. It's now part of our vocabulary that we should include natural capital in our economic accounts. I think the single imp good thing that occurred in the UK government is that um, the biodiversity protection conservation or monitoring thing is now part of the uh, items that any project in the any investment decision in the treasury has to pass. Now that does not mean that it will be carried out that's for sure and that's why there was this resignation Absolutely. But I like to think that in democracies, once you introduce something on the agenda that it has to be included, then it is for us citizens to be able to complain if it's not. And I think putting things, items on the agenda of decision making 
is extremely important, and that was a success. Um, I should let me just one further comment. That is, we've been talking about biodiversity, of course, and yet I've been talking about productivity of ecosystems and what they give. And the connection between them is that biodiversity, when thought about carefully, thoughtfully, um, contributes to the productivity of ecosystems. It's a factor. So quite apart from the intrinsic value of biodiversity, after all, these are li living organisms that we are looking at or populations of organisms, quite apart from that, their presence makes ecosystems flourish. Mm. And so the trans although my review was on the economics of biodiversity, I was able to move away from biodiversity to talking about the productivity of these assets, these the ecosystems, uh, and that's the connection. And I know, Mede, that in some of your projects, you have tried to include the local citizens. You also say it about materials and things like that, but you have tried to have a more inclusive process when making the projects. Could you say a few sort of words about how to do that in a, in a better manner than what is often done? Well, we do that in almost every project that we do. And uh, right now we are working in Abu Dhabi. Um, and these regions in the world seem to have forgotten what is actually their native species. What's, you know, it's part of their cultural heritage. So what we did is that we mapped all the species, plants, uh, that is locally uh, uh, native, indigenous to this site, they can thrive, uh, making a series of public parks. And uh, this is like extreme weather conditions. So if you work uh, spatially with indigenous species, having an understory, a middle story, an overstory, you can actually minimize uh, the amount of irrigation by 40%. And when you do these type of natural nature-based interventions, all the fauna actually comes from wild bees to a series of birds and insects. Um, so for us as a, as a nature-based design studio, we learn to go uh, to Abu Dhabi, but we also from an outsider learn them what's part of actually their cultural heritage. To make them understand and cherish what, what's already there uh, in their everyday life. And it's a public park. Uh, the construction of these parks minimizes uh, the temperature so you can stay outside. So it's a public park meaning that those that you are collaborating with or working with and the investor would be a public municipality yes. or whatever. Yeah. So that would probably sometimes make things easier because isn't one of the challenges if you have a private investor, yeah. then what this he or she invests in is not necessarily, he will not always be the one harvesting the co-benefits that goes not to true. somebody else. Yeah. Is that sometimes uh, the dilemma? That's a dilemma, but we, we did uh, the, the first climate adapted uh, uh, urban space here in Copenhagen, very central space. And it was the city of Copenhagen who sold that land. And one of the conditions was that you should have like a public accessible roof from zero to plus seven and a roof garden. So when you, it's, it's always a collaboration. I mean, normally banks in this category uh, as this bank uh, is like a Fort Knox in a city. Whereas, okay, you can buy this land, dear bank, but then you need to include a public route for bikes, uh, for pedestrians, uh, in order to... Uh, and, and so it's, it's always a collaboration. The big park in a social housing area, it's, it's based on a democracy uh, where it's the residents who has the power. So of course we have to include our end users and we also get inspiration from them. Uh, on how to evolve and how to make flexibility for their to, uh, uh, how their lives should uh, evolve. But to some extent you could say when you, when you include or make participatory design, um, it's very important uh, to, to, to outline the, res 
uh, the different responsibilities in, in a process. Uh, so we always say, well, you as end users, as living in this area, are expert in your life as it is today. We are experts in making special interventions with a lot of nature in it. So how can we together make something, a park, a street, a roundabout, where we actually evolve, where, where life is not, you know, as is, but where we actually evolve, that nudges and pushes uh, for, for change. So I wonder if Sodas Gupta here towards the end, now you have uh, this opportunity with all these architects who can sort of make an impact and uh, imprint on our future built in environment and society. So your last sort of um, advice or a wish to such a group, if we are going to fast forward just somewhat uh, the change that we agree that we need, what would your best advice to this group of people be? Oh my gosh, uh, it would be impertinent of me to give any advice. Uh, I would not give advice, but I could not share. Not when you are asked to uh, asked I, to well, give advice. I could, <laughs> I could share. I could share a thought. That's about as far as I can go, which is the following. I've been intrigued by the fact that our sense of aesthetics, uh, and this is throughout the world, everywhere I've gone, been to, whether it's in Asia or in Europe or America, our aesthetics is one of order, mm. uh, gardens. Um, and the Japanese gardens are, of course, classic example of manipulating nature to make it look exactly as you want it to be, you know, as it were. Order and uh, our sense of aesthetic, we think something is very beautiful uh, when it has a structure which is very well defined and it's sort of, in some sense, clean. And yet, most of nature, underground, if you dig a bit into the soil, or you go into, through a woodland in, when it's wet and you see it's muck. It's extremely disorganized. It's got rotting ve vegetation. It's got uh, worms and slime and you name it. Why do we use such words like slime? You know, it's a sort of a negative tendency. And yet to me now, having un tried to understand the biology involved, the ecology involved in ecosystems, I find that slime very beautiful. The, the what is the disordered, the, the, the decaying processes. I find that very beautiful because it alerts me to the fact that there is a regeneration going on. And so in some sense, if maybe we could learn, educate ourselves into appreciating nature at, in the raw, which is not beautiful in the way we are trained to when you look at paintings or uh, of nature. They're all, say, for example, still lives. Boy, oh boy, are they ordered, <laughs> they're not muck. And uh, so that's one hope that I think it'll be good to transfer our appreciation of beauty uh, in a different direction. And of course, if we do that, eventually we will think that's beautiful too. Hmm. Thank you very much. Appreciation of beauty. And Medith, I know that you have been around here for days, listening to a lot of the messages and sessions, and we have heard it also in this session, collaboration, more education, mindset ch change, and much more focus on values that are not just the economic values. But your sort of most important take away message then, so that when you meet three years from now in Barcelona, that it's not sort of just a repetition of the same messages. What is needed to move faster forward? I would like to um, go in line with what the sculptor just said. Um, for aesthetics, there's two versions at least in my optics. So there's the philosophical one, that's about the beauty, about visual, about you know, our, 
how we uh, sort of judge what is beauty, what is not beauty. But then there's also the aesthetics that is based on natural science that aspires all our senses. So like when you stand in the middle of a forest and you smell the humidity, you listen to the bird, you maybe see a, a sunbeam hitting the ground. I mean, that type of aesthetic, we should include that into our cities because it makes us literally understand on our bodies, in our hearts, that we are part of nature, that we are embedded in nature. So all the economics, all the data and so forth, I definitely, um, that's, that's at least our uh, agenda at SLA. We are going to, we are not stop. We, will, we won't stop. <laughs> I think we all we'll get that, that feeling. More. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Patsavas Gupta and Mette Skjold. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.